record we're on the, we are on the record now on the record as flashback to the track judge jury and executioner that that theme song does not fit though for this tone that james myself and mark up there or to the side of me is presenting but you know what we're presented by blue emu for maximum strength relief of your tired muscles and joints try blue emu and you can do it in multiple ways you can you know apply it with uh, you know, their maximum strength cream and their super strength cream also you can just spray it on and rub it in with their you know, continuous spray i like that continuous spray mark you're really selling me on that actually i love the continuous spray it's the easiest way to put it on it's like spray sunscreen it's fantastic it's one of the greatest inventions ever well, i still rub my sunscreen on you know i i i like to like get it deep get it deep in my skin no. like you're not coming off i oh no see like i'm a sweater man i'm like i sweat the same you gotta, buy the, you gotta buy the sport stuff, you know, you gotta spend the extra two bucks, get the sport stuff. Now I get, I get like surf stuff, like, you know, just like, you know, cause like, you know, you, the water hits you, plus it's getting on your board. So it's like, it's done, done you good in those going situations. going for a dip in Lake Norman when you're at Daytona and then it won't come off, you know, you're good to go. Right? Uh, so. I think that what helps with that is it, it'll get Lake Norma off me. It creates a barrier between my skin. I said Lake Norman, it's called Lake Lloyd. Lake Lloyd. Lake, Lake Norman is where all the basic NASCAR drivers live and post photos of their like wake. That's that's where Loch Ness is. So if, if anyone mm. around Lake Norman can find the Loch Ness monster of Lake Norman, I go. don't know. I don't know if I wonder if they still have big parties out there like Dale Earnhardt did. Oh, probably. Yeah, yeah, they all get together and just party it up. But yeah, they just go wakeboarding and shotgun beers because you know, <laughs> basic, right? I don't know. But, you know, get-togethers are, are nice things to do. And we're at that time of the year, Mark, where people like to get together. And, you know, it's interesting that people get together for a lot of reasons. But for racing, I mean, come on, that's, that's the best reason to get together. And hey, uh, you're not wrong. I mean, you throw Thanksgiving on there too, Mark? No. I don't know if you're a turkey or ham guy. I'm a turkey dude. But, like, you throw a little bit of that in there and some good feelings of, of, of vibes and being thankful I think you might have uh, an interesting recipe for an amazing event. True. Uh, there's a lot of fun things that happen on Thanksgiving. And uh, James introduced me to one that I wasn't really too familiar with, which is the Turkey Night Grand Prix, which is a midget race. And we've decided that in this week's episode that we're going to talk about it, even though I have to say as a Canadian that Thanksgiving was six weeks ago. Um, you guys yeah, missed out and on it. Um, so it was in October. But, you know... Oh, I digress. Um, Thanksgiving in the United States is in November. So uh, this is a race that takes place usually on Thanksgiving night and it's a, a midget sprint car race. And I wasn't really, you know, I don't really know a lot about midget sprint car racing. So this was very interesting for me to watch this race and I had a lot of fun. It was really cool. So we're going to go into just giving you some history about the, the Turkey night Grand Prix and, and everything that, sort of has gone along with it. Uh, it was founded in 1934 and was usually held on Thanksgiving, although not always. Sometimes it was the day after, the day before, you know. Things, things happen that, you know, you have to move things. And it was founded yeah. by Earl Gilmore uh, and it was held at Gilmore Stadium in California, which obviously he owned. And it was originally used as a football field, which is kind of ironic because now we play football on Thanksgiving as well. Um, and it hosted actually the 19, 1940 NFL All-Star Game. It was also a baseball league or a game for the Pacific uh, Coast League. And of course, a midget car venue. So Gilmore Stadium was where we held the inaugural Turkey Night Grand Prix. And the race kind of moved away from Gilmore uh, beginning in 1950 and then has been held at a whole bunch of different tracks uh, since then. Yeah, I mean, it's it's primarily a, a known as a dirt race and it's like inception in history. So it's, you know, visited speedways such as Gilmore Stadium, uh, Gardendale Stadium, Ascot Park, Speedway 605, Sawgrass Speedway, Bakersfield Speedway, Paris Auto Speedway, and of course Ventura Raceway, all during its earlier history within the dirt racing. But you know, late in the 90s, there was a big shift, Mark. This prestigious annual traditional event was going to not be run on dirt. In fact, it was going to move to asphalt and it moved to asphalt in 1999 when it went to Irwindale Speedway. Oh, what, that's a beautiful track. We all know it for its countless Toyota all-star showdowns, amazing events. Well, here's another showdown right here. This is a huge event for 
or just the midget car racing community, open wheel racing community. You, you talked about the history being, you know, held at first in 1934. You know, think of that time. That's after the Great Depression. So you got a boom where people are wanting to get back into doing some, you know, more, you know, lavish things in life like racing. But it also had, had a dark period where, you know, during the Second World War, it, there, there wasn't any events. You know, it kind of speaks to what was going on at the time. Uh, culturally in America that, you know, we had to put a stop to racing for a little bit, but it makes me think a little bit of the Indy 500 mark, you know, like a, uh, like event that has that much prestige and history over time. Uh, that's kind of ingrained in American culture. Uh, but like a lot of other forms of racing get ingrained, but this was, you know, this dates way back to the early 1900s, man. I mean, this is, um, uh, this is like, you know, Nicholas Cage stealing the declaration of independence kind of history, you know? fantastic oh man i need to watch that movie again but oh it's that holiday season you always watch we watched night at the museum we watched night at the museum last night and the next (laughs) movie it wanted us to watch was national treasure and i was like i've seen national treasure a hundred times let's make it 101 i think we're gonna watch it tonight (laughs) but you know it's it's really cool event where it's it's really kind of the indy 500 of midget racing and we'll get into kind of what it means to drivers uh, later on there's some great bits from the race that we look at where they talk about it but uh, JC Agajanian, who, if you're familiar with open wheel racing, is a huge name in open wheel racing, the Agajanian family. Uh, he became the promoter of the race uh, and eventually, you know, changed the feature race to being 98 laps, uh, which reflected the number of the cars that he owned at the Indy 500. So uh, he fielded cars for, you know, Parnelli Jones. He's definitely the most famous driver associated with JC Agajanian. And the Agajanian family is still like deeply rooted in American motorsport, you know, like they're part owners of Curb Agajanian Performance Group with Mike Curb. Uh, you know, they're involved with Stuart Haas's number 98 Xfinity car. They also have an ownership stake in Brian Herta Autosport in both IndyCar and IMSA. They have cars number 98 as well. So it's really become, you know, the Agajanian is just people that are really high on motorsports. They love it. They still want to be involved in it, you know, which is fantastic. And the cool thing about the Turkey Night is that it's run in November during Thanksgiving. So it's after all the other motorsport calendars or most of the motorsport calendars end. So you have a lot of heavy hitting drivers that come and run this event because their seasons are already over. A lot of guys from NASCAR, Tony Stewart, Casey Kane, guys like that will come and run it. So it really, it opens them up for that. And finally, you know, Turkey night's really something to raise your spirits as a Detroit Lions fan, because after you watch them lose at 1230, you can watch Turkey night and be happy because you're watching racing. So it's great. For me, that's that, that's great. I mean, you gotta have some hope. Like, do you do you go into the coin co- coin toss with like some kind of like yes aspirations, like five percent? No, they're gonna lose. No, oh, I, and then oh. they lose, and then the Christmas tree goes up. That's how you get over it. Mm. So yeah. you have to erect that tree. Yep. to get over it. To get over it, get in the holiday spirit, and cleanse your sins of darkness. So. Well, to Mark's point earlier, yeah, there has been some pretty prestigious drivers that have competed in this race. I mean, from the likes of AJ Foyt, Jeff Gordon, uh, NASCAR drivers Casey Kane, Tony Stewart, who uh, actually had an open wheel career for a while as well. Uh, you've got uh, Jason Leffler as a former winner. JJ Yaley has competed in it. Uh, you have Christopher Bell, who recently has claimed a Turkey Night victory in the Grand Prix. And then also, you know, it's nice to see in the history that uh, it kind of went back to dirt after its time at uh, Irwindale on the asphalt, went back and and became a a dirt event, kind of like traditional within its history. And then it's just always been, like you said, Mark, a place in history for open wheel racing. Uh, It's one of those events that you got to have it on your resume to feel like you completed something. It's like a, like an Indy 500 or Daytona 500, one of those crown jewel events. It's the thing. It's, it's a big milestone event to achieve. And uh, as we've talked about, it's a midget race. So they race it with midget cars. Uh, this is something, uh, if you're Australian, that's what, a, that's what they call a speed car. Uh, we call them midget cars in North America. I think we should we just refer it to as speed cars from now on. Cause like we're trying to be like fancy and like expand our vocabulary, but mm-hmm. like also be obscure and throw people off. It's like, what are you talking about? It's like, Oh, you know, midget car. It's like, oh, what's going that? It's speed like, car races. We're going on the speed car races. That's right. So yeah. speed cars. So speed we'll, we'll cars. be those guys. But they run them on on uh, you know dirt and and pavement, all types of different surfaces. Um, they run them on you know quarter mile tracks, smaller bull rings, some bigger half mile speedways, and the cars are super light. So they're they weigh about nine hundred fifty pounds. 
and they have an engine that go that does about 350 horsepower. So you can go pretty fast in a 950 pound car yeah. at 350 horsepower. So remember, for, horsepower is not everything, folks. People joke about that, but like if your car doesn't weigh anything, you don't need a lot of horsepower. Uh, midgets are about 10 feet long for the front bumper to the rear bumper, and you're, you've got a 65 inch axle width. And the wheelbase is like 65 inches to 76 inches, depending on, you know, on the size of the track, really. So they, they change it up depending on, they, they optimize it for whatever track and surface they're going to be racing on. Oh, yeah. And you also spoke about like, you know, hey, horsepower isn't always the biggest thing, too. Well, they, they've got a lot of grip, too. They're, they're running on some really wide, slick tires when they're running on the asphalt. And then running on dirt, they got some pretty uh, interesting treaded tires. So these these cars can like, get through the corners and put the power down as well. And you mentioned the, the axle width too, that also helps with it as well. So it's a very interesting vehicle, Mark. I'm, I've never driven one in real life. I've driven them in iRacing, they're super fun, uh, super technical. And you, you get worn out too wearing it uh, when you're driving them because of the, the quick you know, steering box. You know, you're making super precise movements. You don't want to be super quick, but quick enough. Mm -hmm. And James, the race we decided to talk about, you know, we had to pick one. So we've decided to talk about the 2002 Turkey night Grand Prix at Irwindale. This one is on asphalt. So uh, it's, it's not like the classic dirt races, but it's a really interesting Turkey night. It's a cool race. Uh, we had a lot of fun uh, talking about it and it was a, uh, it had a really great broadcast as well. James, this race is on ESPN two. That's right. ESPN two. This is my kind of uh, Turkey night that I remember. I remember watching these Thursday night thunder, Saturday night thunder events. Uh, the last couple of ones that were aired on ESPN and ESPN two and this broadcast for ESPN two, we've got Bob Jenkins in the booth, the voice of thunder. And we also have Larry Rice. Another great job ESPN always did was incorporating people from within the specific motorsports industry. They didn't just get like Bob Jenkins and another ESPN talent. They got an ESPN talent that was specifically around uh, open wheel racing and uh, specifically USAC racing. Then on pit road, they had the heavy hitters. They had our boy, Ray Dunlap. Go look up our interview with Ray. It was really fun. He's so yeah. insightful, super He's incredible, just fun guy to talk to. And then we also have Amy East. That's right, girl. She's getting it, doing her due diligence on pit road and she's you know trying to you know be fair because she's also bobby east's sister you know so she does have a a little bit of a i don't know what, what we would call that again mark is that technically a uh a conflict of interest yeah, yeah. conflict of interest right there well we wendy venturini was the same for years too you know and we were okay with that you know i mean yeah it was okay but i mean there's something fishy here mark i smell a conspiracy theory brewing well, well, we'll have to see what happens with Bobby East in the race. But James, have to get to our favorite part of these race review episodes, and that is Strange Starters. Strange starters. Mm -hmm. Ooh, yeah, it's strange because, Mark, you're a fish out of water. You don't know yeah, anybody. I don't know who any of these guys are, so they're all strange. <laughs> Actually, Everyone no, is there, strange. there is some pretty uh, you know, notable faces in this field, not just because it is the uh, Turkey Night Grand Prix, but also because a lot of notable faces in racing have come up through the USAC ranks and the late 90s and mid 2000s had a plethora of great drivers. Mark, why don't you lead us off? Well, first up, we have to go with the heaviest hitter of all in the field. And that is Tony Stewart, the reigning Winston Cup champion. He had just won the 2002 NASCAR Cup Series championship. And uh, he has roots in open wheel racing. It's where he came from. Running, running dirt cars, uh, you know, in, in open wheel and midgets and sprints. He's the 1996-97 IndyCar, sorry, IRL series champion. People kind of forget about that about Tony Stewart. He had a very successful open wheel career in the IRL before coming to NASCAR. So this is just like going back to his roots. And he did win one of the support races that night. He won the USAC Western Sprint Car Division race uh, earlier before the feature race. So he's ready to go, man. Next up, we've got... Dave Steele, Florida boy from Tampa, Florida. He is the defending winner of the Turkey Night Grand Prix. He was the 2000 winner. Um, so coming into this event, he had a lot to strive for. Now, here's something that you should know about Dave. During his USAC career, he collected two Silver, Silver Crown championships. Not only that, throughout his time, he had 60 victories throughout sprints, midgets, and Silver Crown competition. So he was a well-diverse driver, a legend in the sprint car community. Uh, 
legend. May he rest in peace. Yes, RIP, Dave. Next up, we have another NASCAR heavy hitter. We have Casey Kane, but this is kind of before he was really big in NASCAR. He's taken a break from his move to the Bush Series. He was racing with Robert Yates at the time, kind of transitioning from, you know, sprint cars to NASCAR. Uh, grew up racing USAC. It's one of, you know, it's premier events. So it only makes sense that he'd want to come back and run this race and try and win it. And uh, at this point in his career, coming into this race, he has 11 career midget car victories. So Casey Kane is definitely going to be a guy to watch in this one. Next up, we have a teammate of Casey Kane, Bobby East. Now, Robert Bobby East carries a name that is synonymous with winning in open wheel racing. All right. He became the youngest winner in USAC competition in the midget ranks in 2001 at 16 years old, six months and 28, uh, 25 days. All right. That's super young. Now, 2002 marked his first full season with the infamous Team Beast, the number nine racing team. Now, uh, Bobby did pull triple duty that night. He's going to compete in the Turkey Night Grand Prix, but he also competed in the Ford Focus Midget event and the Western uh, Sprint uh, Car Race. So, man, he's pulling triple duty. Seat Jeez. time, man. Yeah. It's all about development. It's so. important at this race. You need, like, the more laps you're getting the, uh, on this track, uh, the more of an advantage you have. So, a lot of these names all competed in either, like, the Western Sprints or the, the Focus Midget Race. And next up, we have well, one of our boys, J.J. Yaley. Now, he is only the second driver ever to achieve the triple crown in a single season, and Tony Stewart is the other. So they're both in this race, which is fantastic. J.J. is an incredible sprint car driver, another guy that tried to carve out a career in the IRL. Didn't quite work out, and uh, later on, he's going to end up uh, in NASCAR. And if you want to learn more about that, check out our Strange Starters video on JJ Daly on YouTube. You can click right above me right now if you're watching on YouTube. It's right there. Just click, click and watch it. Next up and finally, we have Jason Leffler. Left turn. Man, my, one of my favorite drivers uh, from watching NASCAR. But if you were just watching him in NASCAR, you might have forgotten that he had quite a career in the USAC ranks uh, throughout the mid and late 90s. He actually collected three consecutive USAC Midget Championships, Drivers' Championships, all right? This guy was a beast to be reckoned with. And he also had already won a Turkey Night Grand Prix. So he's just there trying to collect another one. Man, Leffler in his prime right now and in his element in a midget. He's also driving a car that he owns. That's his own car, yeah. Mopar car. He bought it just to come back and run midget races for fun. So... Exactly. Man, 1998 he's a hired gun right now, man. Yeah, because yeah. at this point he's uh, it's 2002, so he's just coming off of uh, the, his first year with Ultra in the Truck Series. He, you know, ran those last couple of races with Ultra in the Cup Series that you can see from our Teams Over Time video if you ever want to check that out. But yeah, Leffler, man, he's he's definitely in his element this time in this region, you know, because uh, this is where he came up from. So we'll get into some background about this race. This is the 62nd running of the Turkey Night Grand Prix. Uh, the evening featured several support races, including that USAC Western Spring Car Race we talked about, the Tony Stewart one. But the main event is the 100 lap midget feature race that we are talking about. Um, winning the Turkey Night really is like winning the Indy 500 as midget spring cars. And during the broadcast or before the race started, we got to see or speak with some of the competitors and, and talk to them about what it would mean to them to win this race. Win the Turkey Night Grand Prix and my racing book, that would have to equal like Indianapolis 500 victory. Well, winning the Turkey Night Grand Prix has been like one of my goals you know, throughout my whole ninja career. It'd be huge. Turkey Night's probably the you know most prestigious race we run all year. And uh, finishing the top five before with the win, it'd be a pretty neat deal. I mean everything, because this is one of the races that my dad was never uh, able to win. That uh, If I could win, I could have a little bit more bragging rights than he has. We've been looking for a win all year long and to win one of the biggest races on payment this year. It just mean everything to us and give us a lot of momentum going into next year. All these guys want to win this thing really, really bad. Well, some, some more than others. Some are like, it'd be nice to win. And then some guys are like, this would be like the greatest accomplishment of my whole life. So a lot of, a lot of nerves. Everyone's excited, wants to get this race going. It's 100 laps and caution laps do count. So yeah, it's, uh, it's right. going to be interesting. Yeah, you can't just putz away around with the caution, think you've got time. 100 laps is going to go by very fast here at Irwindale Mart, as we know. And it's a pretty stout field. you got 31 drivers. They're trying to compete for that ultimate prize, and that is to win 
the Turkey Night Grand Prix. Sprint car ace, JJ Yaley, your boy Mark, he is on the front row with teammate Bobby East, who ironically is also Amy East's pick. I'm serious, Mark. There's a conspiracy theory brewing yeah. here. He's starting second already. Well, she kind of has to make that pick. And then Ray Dunlap picked Dave Steele. So that's a, that's a good pick by Ray. I'm just not to be biased by that one. That's another good pick. But Mark, you know, we've, we've done it before and we got to do it again. We got to salute the fans and we're going to go four wide with the four wide salute for the fans, man. That's love, love the four wide salute, yeah, man. The way that. they do it, the way they form it up and then the middle drops back to like, it's just so cool to watch. Yeah. It's like, they, they all know what they're doing. They're, they're, they're so orchestrated with what, doing that i don't even think they really have many like control, like uh communication for like exactly what's going on it's just like all right just do the salute and then they do it and they're like all right get back in line and then they get back in line it's it's oh, excellent shit. it's like the rose bowl parade but better <laughs> uh, so we get the green flag and we're racing on turkey night jj yaley is going to lead that first lap from pole but only by inches they're already three wide behind him then bobby e slips by takes the lead and jj yaley's got an anchor tied to that thing he's going backwards uh, Michael Lewis gets by him as well. Uh, and then we go get some onboard shots. And the only onboard camera in the, in the field is on Josh Wise. Yes, that Josh Wise, if you're a NASCAR fan. He started deeper in the field, but I love this camera angle we get to see. We get two angles, one out the front uh, on, the, on the left side of his car. You get to see when he's turning into the corner. And then we get a shot of Wise working the steering wheel. And he's got it set up like a bus driver, you know? Like, it's just really cool to see him turning that wheel. And like James talked about, how even how hard these are in iRacing racing to drive just you really see how much he has to fight the wheel to turn so awesome to see that in car work yeah but i don't have the luxury of like you know i have the luxury of putting the wheel up where i want to he's got that like you said like a like a school bus and that's how all these drivers are sitting in these vehicles manhandling them around this track amazing to see it we're 10 laps in and bobby east is up front conspiracy i'm telling you conspiracies and he's holding off michael lewis for now tony stewart Biding his time. He's sitting in third and Casey Kane, he's there, but he's battling with him. And I think Casey Kane's probably got one of the strongest cars in this field. Now, Michael Lewis, he's going to take the lead just as Teddy Beach spins and stops on track. And Mark, that's going to bring out our first caution of the night. Beach has beached it on, on the high banks. He's going to need a push start to get going and we're under caution. So we're checking in with Ray Dunlap. He's going to give us the scoop from defending Turkey night winner. Dave Steele. And, and Bob, fifth on that list is Dave Steele. I think he has the hottest left front brake rotor I've seen on one of these midget cars in a long time. He's really been working that brake a lot. And I think you're going to see Steele's car get a lot better in the late stages of this race after we get to lap 70, because when his fuel burns off, that'll change his chassis quite a bit. And I think he'll be able to get into the turns without using quite as much brake. Thanks for that info, Ray. God, just hustling down there, fighting stuff out. And again, it's Ray's pick, so he's got skin in the game. He wants Dave Steele to win this race. I mean, they're in Vegas. They definitely put some money on this, my man. Yeah. <laughs> the green flag comes back out. We're on, we are restarting lap 25. And you see how they come to the line in single file. And as soon as the green flag flies, they fan out like crazy trying to make, make up ground on the restart. Like, these cars are awesome to watch race. You know, we got movers and shakers. Bobby East drops all the way back to sixth. But Tony Stewart and Dave Steele, they take advantage. They move up to third and fourth. And Bobby E seems to have picked up something on his car. There's something arrow-wise, like a streamer or something on his car. And I know they would put those on at some tracks to, to signify rookies, but that wasn't on there at the start of the race. Yeah, no, that's like a big old tr trash bag or something. Jeez, it's some kind of plastic bag. I, I don't know how the heck that's uh, like affecting the performance. It might just be a distraction to, to his competitors behind him, but apparently he's dropping like a rock. And I guess conspiracy theory, not. Nah, he's, he's struggling right now as these laps tick by. Meanwhile, though, up front as the laps tick by, Casey Kane is all over the back bumper of Michael Lewis. The battle is heating up. But you know what? We got to take a quick commercial break and pay our bills. So we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Do you ever have like tired muscles like this one right here? I've been working out a little bit and just some aching just joints, you know, after a long day of activity, doing those chin-ups and you know, riding your bike. If so, our friends at Blue Emu have you covered with a wide variety of maximum strength products that work fast and are completely odorless. That's right, you won't stink. Be sure to check out Blue Emu in its brand new look at major retailers near you. For maximum strength relief, 
gotta go with Blue Emu. Now let's get back to the podcast. Every time that my car isn't on the track racing, Sid, I'm out here at the uh, sanitary department. Indianapolis uh, sanitary department has a, a terrific department. They do a real good job, and I learn a lot here every summer or during the month of May anyway. Well, how do you get a driver rag? Well, I brought my driver with me, Sid. Did we meet him? Yes. Cornelli! Got a good driver. Oh, he's all right. Yankee, I came back here to race. Yeah, but I'll tell you something. If you don't win the race, you'll be driving this all next winter. Always some wholesome stuff when you get to see those old clips from the 60s, you know? Gary, oh, yeah. you know, Agajanian family, waste management and race cars, Scott. The, 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 the way these things happen, it's just crazy. You know, I, just love that, I just love that someone actually recorded that, and it's archived, man. Someone kept that forever. We needed that footage. We, we need those things. We need those, those archives of footage, you know? And speaking of the Agajanian family, J.C. Agajanian Jr. is going to join us in the booth to talk about this great event. But right as he starts talking, we're interrupted by a violent crash involving Tony Stewart and Aaron Fike. Both drivers are shaken up. Fike gets out of the car on his own, on his own power, but you see him, it's kind of scary. He's laying on the back. He's clearly like, on the track. He's clearly dazed. Tony climbs out slowly, says he's got some foot pain, but he's otherwise okay. And the replay shows really that Aaron Fike's throttle must have stuck. And those are always terrifying crashes when you see that he has no way to slow down. He just clipped the back of Tony. They both hit the wall. And uh, fortunately, it was just minor injuries. Everybody was okay. Nobody had to go to the hospital. So really thankful for that. And uh, just before we go back to green, Amy's going to check in with Aaron Fike. Well, and I am as Aaron sits down on this quad here. Aaron, you've got some ice on your wrist. First of all, are you okay? That was a very hard hit. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, just a freak accident. My throttle stuck, and uh, it's really too bad for me and Tony. I mean, we both had good cars. Uh, just something in racing that happens every once in a while. You know, we don't like to see it happen, but uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know what to say about it, really. Okay, well, Thanks for that, Amy. Oh, man, Aaron Aaron had some ice on his wrist there. He, he'll be okay. He put the ice on the wrist. It's all good. But, you know, he had nowhere to go. It was either running into the back of the other black car or hit Tony Stewart, you know, unfortunate. And you could just hear it in his voice. But meanwhile, we're going to get back to racing. And up front, it's again the Michael Lewis and Casey Kane show. Now, Casey Kane continues to put the pressure on Lewis. He almost gets by him, and he's trying everywhere. Hi low but lewis just is able to hold him at bay get enough of a run off just to keep him uh you know just right behind him it seems like though he almost chops him every time he goes into turn three mark every time it's just like comes up he's gonna get him and then lewis is his line is perfect that's the thing and yeah. there's nothing that casey can do to catch him because the cars are so equal so it's it's tough man it, it's tough to see but it's genuine racing that's what you want to see you know and, and also just how close Casey's able to understand to get to Lewis's car. He's like really up on him. You'd think like, oh man, he's going to hit him. But like, it's just that uh, the wear of, of, of knowing exactly where you are on track, where your competitor is on track, especially in these kinds of cars. Because when you like touch wheels, you're going up in the air. There's no like, you know, casual contact in this form of racing. It's the thing. You're not, you don't want to be bumping people. And, but we do get some bumping. We get another caution as Dane Carter and Ron Gregory get together and hit the wall. We don't get a replay. We don't really know what happened, but apparently there's no hard feelings. Uh, Ron tries to help Dane get his car restarted uh, before the safety uh, crew arrives, but uh, they would both be out of contention. So it's now getting really close to the end. It takes a while to clean that up. We're down at 11 laps to go. Yeah, and Lewis is still in front, but here's the thing. Casey Kane might have been able to figure out a way around him we'll see but he doesn't have much time as we get the green flag it's almost three wide three rows deep as they all try to battle for what they can get up in the field but lewis and kane are the two that are going to command this race they are going to stretch away from the field and they're going to battle and it's going to be almost side by side at times kane trying to get that run off the corner but just can't do it lewis holding him at bay it's an incredible battle mark i I'm trying to see Kane get by him, but I, he can't. Lewis is just going to hold him off, and Michael Lewis will take the 2002 Turkey Night Grand Prix victory over Casey Kane, who tried every which line, even the high side, just didn't have enough time to get around Michael Lewis for the victory. What 
what a race, Mark, man. I, do, you, do you like USAC sprint car I, racing I, and midget I, racing? I think now? I dig USAC sprint car and midget racing. Just to watch that battle, like, it's clear that Casey Kane and Michael Lewis were the two fastest cars because they were half a straightaway ahead of everybody else. And just the battling, you see the different lines, the diving outside, the diving back on inside and trying to make the pass. It was just incredible to watch. And no beating and banging, just straight racing, you know? Mm-hmm. Basically, like let, it, it, it's like IndyCar, but slower, but on a smaller track. So it's still amazing to watch. And I, I'm down, man. I want to go to some of these races and see some of this. But James, we got to throw it down to Ray Dunlap to hear from our winner, Michael Lewis, who's absolutely elated that he's won this race. Well, Bob, this guy's had some pretty big wins in his career out there at Phoenix. I thought was a good one, but guess what, buddy? You won Turkey Night. I'll tell you what, first of all, uh, this one's for my good friend Bob Nerville that passed away this weekend. Uh, this is all for you, buddy. Uh, uh, wish your family, you know, just uh, you get through it. And uh, what can I say this? Uh, electronic chrome and grinding beast uh, was hooked up. We had these uh, uh, two quick shocks on. Brought on a new sponsor, Team ASC, this weekend. Uh, this is awesome. And you know what Larry Rice said? The most important thing tonight was you didn't make a mistake all through the race. No, about 20 laps to go. I, uh, I think it's Casey who put some pressure on me, but uh, I stayed calm, ran my line, and ran my own race. And it was a great pass for the lead, too. You were able to get up there, you saw the opportunity, and you took it. Yeah, the, I, th- I think it's Casey who's working outside, got around Bobby, and... Uh, if I let him go, he'd have been tough to get, so I had to, I had to get on it and step it up and get back by him, and, man, this is awesome. <laughs> he said it's awesome three times in there, I think, guys. It's awesome. Michael Lewis is the winner at Turkey Night. Man, the, the, just the, the happiness in his voice, you know, the how happy he is to win this race. He's won the Indy 500 of midget racing. And, and also, not, not, let's not, like, take away from the moment from Ray. He's got a masterful goatee. Jeez, I've never seen Ray with a goatee. We've seen so many forms of Ray Dunlap over the last couple of weeks. Ray with mustache, Ray with no mustache. Now, goatee Ray. I like yeah, it. Yeah, but it was a short-lived goatee Ray, so it must not have worked out. But you know what? You got to you gotta try things different. You know, you're on TV. You got to reinvent yourself, you know? So, and yeah, he, he, had, he had that edgy look of the uh, early 2000s right there. But, Mark, let's go through the top 10. This was an amazing race, and it had some interesting, you know, movers and shakers, like we said, throughout the field. And in the top 10, it reflects it of obviously Michael Lewis coming home with the victory. Casey Kane, a close second. Defending race winner, Dave Steele, is going to come up short, but he'll come up in third. He'll be on the podium, my man. Ah, but there's no podium. There's, there, there, there's, no. there's one winner and 30 losers. There's no podium. Uh, third play, uh, fourth place, sorry, of Bobby East. So like you said, the conspiracy, you know, it got him a top five. but Debunked, man. Dang. Uh, our boy J.J. Yale, he started on pole, had a rough night, wasn't really involved. He led that first lap and then kind of just dropped anchor and he ended up in fifth place. Steve Payton in sixth, James Chesson in seventh. He actually takes home the award for passing the most cars in the race, started very deep in the field. Jason Leffler, our boy, in eighth place, Jerome Rodella in ninth, and A.J. Fike, Aaron Fike's brother, comes home in the 10th position. So, Pretty solid top 10. It was a great race. Tough that Tony Stewart and Aaron Fike both got taken out. They were both running very high up uh, at the time. Definitely would have been in it at the end. Probably would have given, well, I don't know, would they have given Michael Lewis and Casey Kane a run for their money? They were really fast. So a really cool race, man. I'm glad you picked this one because I was kind of looking through. I'm like, oh, we should do the, the Leffler one. You're like, no, no, 2002 is the best one. I was like, and you, you, you know, you delivered, man. It was a fantastic race, which really brings us to, you know, what we always do, we have to rate this race. I'm going to talk about what we learned. So James, what would you rate the 2002 Turkey Night Grand Prix? Oh, you know, I got to give this one an 8.5 because A, you have some nostalgia factor and you can build some really good history notes about this race. So there's a lot to this event. So that adds to it. Um, it's a very unique event. You're not going to see this every, every race you see, uh, it would be nice, but, you know, obviously a lot of people aren't always consistently watching USAC racing. So this should be definitely a different perspective, a different view take. And it's good racing. It's, it's just, you, you, you can watch what these drivers are doing with these cars throughout the corner. And you're seeing two different styles of driving, yet they accomplish almost the same feat by running similar lap times or being right on top of each other, racing side by side. It's really masterful and pure to watch so it's you got big heavy hitters in this field and that just speaks to 
you know, the backgrounds of these drivers who eventually would go on to different disciplines and different series. Uh, but it's, it's just a really good event. And I think, you know, the asphalt ones are, the asphalt ones are very interesting because they, you know, they, they had a short lived time, but it also shows the diversity that comes with racing in uh, the USAC and racing midgets and sprint cars across or fast cars across the world. Um, you know, you can run them on ovals, you can run them on dirt tracks, short or long. It's all about getting through those corners and it takes a lot to understand that and, and to do that, execute that all the time. So uh, amazing race. Hopefully it was something different. Uh, Mark, what would you rate in, uh, on this one? Uh, I'm going to be right there with you. I'm going to give it an, uh, an eight. I'm going to give it an 8.5 because I think that for me coming into this kind of with no real benchmark, uh, not really ever watching much of this type of racing, it was really cool to watch. It was a lot of fun. Like you said, the, the racing was incredible. I'm a fan of racing. I like to watch racing. I don't care what it is. I like to watch races. And, and this was an amazing race. There was really cool battling between Michael Lewis and Casey Kane in the front of the field. Like you said, running all the different lines and just seeing that these heavy hitters come in and they get beat by the guy who's there every week. You know, this is not the kind of series where Tony Stewart can just come in and win all the races because of who he is and, and his acumen, you know, he's got to compete against these guys that do it every single week. And that's really cool. You know, I, it, it's, it's awesome to see that you have these heavy hitters come down and, and, and they're not often not as successful, you know, unless you're, you know, Kyle Larson or somebody who comes down and wins a lot of races, but you know, it's, it's, it was really cool to watch. I really enjoyed it. And I think it's something I'm going to, I'm going to look forward to maybe going to, you know, in the future is, is a, is a sprint car race. I'd love to see it in person. Uh, obviously I'd love to experience a chili bowl sometime. That's something that people always say is just one of the greatest events ever uh, to go see, you know, a deafening indoor dirt sprint car race. So really cool. You picked the asphalt one as well, because it was a short lived part of the history of this event. Um, but definitely really cool and, and definitely easier for me to, to watch and understand. Uh, I haven't watched a lot of dirt racing. So we did uh, review that ARCA race on dirt. So kind of the opposite, you know, going to see, you know, uh, stock cars on dirt. So you can, you can check that review out. It's a really cool one. It's from, uh, from a few months ago, but yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it, man. What I learned is that sprint car racing is legitimately uh, awesome. It doesn't matter what the size of the car is. It's great racing. You know, it's some of the best racing that you'll watch. And there's some, some great drivers in this field that went on to do all kinds of different things that have great stories. So look up some of the guys that were in this field, like, you know, Yaley and Bobby East and Tracy Hines and, you know, and uh, I'm trying to think of some other guys that were in there, but they, you know, they go on to have very interesting careers in motorsport. And like James said, so many guys in major open wheel racing started doing this. So, you know, we, we had Jeff Gordon, AJ Foyt, guys like that, Mario Andretti, racing all kinds of these, these sort of cars. So it's really cool, man. I really enjoyed it. 8.5. Oh yeah. It's a great one. And if anyone would learn the biggest thing as we come to the end of the broadcast is that this was the end of an era. This was the end of the thunder era. ESPN had worked throughout the eighties and nineties and early two thousands to help showcase USAC and open wheel racing competition throughout the United States. And this was the end of their broadcasting term. Well, second to last race, they had one more broadcast to go, but this would be the last Thursday night Thunder event. And, you know, if we could leave you with anything on flashback to the track presented by Blue Emu for your maximum strength, relief of tired muscles and joints that ache and have pains and whatnots, try Blue Emu. We'll leave you with the final farewell from Thunder. Uh, and the uh, beautiful clips and sounds of what the Thunder was. Mark, it was fun. It was really enjoyable, man. I hope we uh, get to do this again pretty soon. Maybe we'll do something a little bit different as well, but I thoroughly enjoyed it as well. It was great, man. Short, short and sweet, but we you know, Thanksgiving dinner. It's on the, on the stove, so we have to get going. Oh, yeah. Enjoy the thunder. Have a great one, everyone.